All right, we're here. Doom Drop Podcast. We're back. Shun, sorry about this. Um, I guess we got to tell the audience we just did about 10 minutes of recording and the audio was messed up for Shun. So um, that's my bad. We uh, just wasted about 10 minutes, but uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, audio, really audio issues. Audio issues are always a bitch, man. How many times yeah. have you been in some sort of cast or uh, working with someone and there's audio issues? It feels like basically <laughs> every time I go to cast with somebody or do BSL or anything, there's always some sort yeah. of audio issue. You had a funny moment when I was casting BSL recently of Noken and um, it was the Chinese players playing. So it was a Chinese observer that we were watching the Chinese uh, stream like using their feed and there was obviously like sometimes there was issues where like yeah the feed would just cut out and it's just like a still screen and like um at one point i just ran a joke and i was like please stand by while we try to connect you and saying stuff like that you know mm -hmm. like making at and t jokes you know? but that was like the the video feed was was messed up yeah we had to keep switching to using noken's perspective because um yeah for some because the because we were using a Chinese observer's uh, point of view oh. uh, for the stream. And I guess, uh, I'm not sure if it was zero lagging out or if it was the Chinese streamer lagging out. But yeah, we were getting issues with that. It's always hard to connect with Chinese servers, man. So rough. Because yeah. I got to go through VP VPN just to connect with you. It's um, one of the most annoying parts about living in China when I was there is that you just couldn't couldn't do anything without getting on a VPN. I never even knew that when I first went to China way, way back. Um, well, I think, I'm not, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. that might be to do with you need to do pretty much anything in China. You need like ID. So like say if you want to download a game on the Play Store, like you need mm -hmm. like your Chinese ID to even be able to do that, right? Yeah. I think, so I guess that's a, a good like track and trace for the CCP having that feature. Mm -hmm. But I guess as far as the average Chinese citizen is concerned, that's probably a, a big nuisance and also doesn't allow you to really do anything without being watched very closely. Well, yeah. And, and if you're in China, you're not able to get on Google or Facebook or Instagram right. unless you have a VPN. Um, doesn't matter if you have ID or not. I didn't know that when I got there for the first time. I had a really hard time contacting my family because it's not it's not like they're also advertising VPNs. You know, you got, <laughs> you got to find somebody else who knows about it. Um yeah. or I did. I had to find somebody who knows about um how to get a VPN and how to use it. Well, the, and there's even like dedicated hacker group. There's mm -hmm. even dedicated like hacker groups that like help people in those kinds of countries be able to communicate with the outside world in a secure way like say they're a whistleblower or they're in danger or like they want to get out of the country or, or something's going on and they want to be able to communicate without their government watching them like there's even like hacker groups dedicated to to giving this those kinds of so-called uh, you know uh, oppressed people like uh, the, the the tools in which to communicate freely in the world without like censorship or like you know Right. Well, if you use a VPN in, in China, it's actually against the law. So you can actually go to jail for that. Pretty, Which pretty is sad. kind of crazy to think about, yeah. Yeah, but they, they don't really... Um, It's funny, because if I talk about this, people will be like, oh, I have a VPN, I live in China, it's fine. But the thing is, that's how the communist government works, is they uh, allow you to get away with breaking the law in a lot of different areas and circumstances but they know that you're doing like they they, they have information knowing that you're doing it they kind of let you get away with it until you become a, a nuisance to them and then they enforce the law you know what i mean so it's like yeah as long as you're not doing anything that we don't like you can break the law but as soon as we don't like what you're doing jail straight to jail you know what i mean but then they have <laughs> but then they already have the the, the dirt the reason they got the dirt. you jail yeah. you yeah they got the dirt so it's like yeah in a way it's like how you would run like a, a criminal organization like mm -hmm. you'd want dirt on each other you know what i mean right. you'd want that on each other if anything yeah it is a criminal organization but 
Let's not uh, let's not delve too deeply in there. We'll get lost in the weeds. Um, yeah, let's let's talk a bit about StarCraft, man, because uh, I've been doing a lot of uh, research and videos and stuff recently about StarCraft and thinking about like what's the next big video that I want to put out. What do I want to try to focus on, and is there actually space for someone to do videos like that? You know, like I, I right. I was taking a look around at some other content that's coming out, like other content creators who are making videos about StarCraft. It's mostly StarCraft 2, and that seems to be where a lot of the views are going. And there's like just a small like niche uh, creator community of people making StarCraft 1. Like, have you ever seen uh, Okso? He's like one of Oxo. those. Yeah, he's like one of those creators. Um, He's a, a Korean, I think, and he does like a few kind of feature videos talking about, you know, different historical moments in Brood War. Has like 500 subs, something like that, but he's been making videos for quite some time. Um, no, no yeah. I haven't seen his content. You have to link him to me. Sure. There's like Jinjin as well. Um, you know him, obviously. There's yeah. uh, like a few other creators. Uh, there's one guy who does only um, content related to uh, the way that the game engine works in StarCraft 1. And I can't remember what his idea is, what his name is on YouTube, but uh, there's like just a few content creators scattered around and uh, they seem to have like some sort of like semi like minor ish success and i have obviously done quite a few videos but my biggest video of all time has been about starcraft 2 right and the differences between starcraft 2 and brood war which is a little bit depressing yeah i mean that is kind of unfortunately is what it is i mean it does have a bigger scene you could argue that starcraft 2 in, in terms of its previous success is dying but obviously it still has a quite a large player base and quite a large fan base still so I think it still will dwarf the numbers of the Brood War community quite significantly. But you were telling me before about how you want to do like more of these feature length videos, mm -hmm. feature videos, but also try to you know make them palatable for a wider audience, like keeping them shorter length, like more like five, six minutes rather than ten plus minutes. And we were talking about how like that kind of shorter form content is ideal for people that aren't like completely invested in you as a content creator or what you're talking about necessarily yet. Right. Some people who are more interested in just the gaming uh, sphere or just part of the gaming sphere um, right. in general, rather than directly related to brood war, maybe they can still get something out of like brood war related content. For example, right. my pro league video that I'm, we were just talking about um, that I'm putting out tonight uh, about how these pro league players uh, are making their own tournament as streamers and putting it all together themselves and making you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars per year just doing it completely on their own and like how that type of uh, tournament or that that like format of tournament could be used in other games. Uh, particularly like older games that don't really have a good thriving tournament scene, don't have like big prize pools anymore to support pro players. Maybe they could also support pro players by having like a tournament like that instead. So yeah. that's sort of like, it's related to StarCraft Brood War, but it could be viewed by a wider audience and maybe it'll bring more interest into Brood War. Do you know what I mean? That That's my ultimate goal is to keep brood war alive you know to keep it going and to like support it as a community member but i also want to do well for myself you know i want to bring more people in i want to like get more uh success yeah it's it's like a it's a hard right. well, it's a hard thing to do <laughs> yeah no i i admire that i like i both commend the the effort of wanting to like re keep the the scene rejuvenated but also like build yourself like yeah i think that makes sense but you, i guess the issue you're having right now is like you've, you've had some growth from your brood war content and you've like you've surpassed five thousand subscribers but now you're starting to hit that ceiling a little bit and you're wondering wait a minute i need to keep 
finding ways of grow growing here because like, I don't want to stagnate too much from only relying on the Brood War community for your viewership, right? I think, yeah, the viewer, the Brood War community, it's not like I've topped out on the amount of Brood War viewers because I, I can see other um, content creators like Artosis Tasteless, um, right? these big creators who have, you know, huge amounts of viewers. Um, definitely there's more room to grow here, but uh, there's just uh, so many more people in the wider gaming space, of course. And I would also not be too hesitant to like branch out into other RTS if there was like another great RTS that I was really into coming out in the future. It would be interesting to like put some of that content in as well. It's just yeah, I um I don't know. I want to I want to grow faster like you were saying. <laughs> I want to yeah. I want to get bigger, of course. Well, as a content creator, it can be difficult because you can kind of get pigeonholed into like one style or format or one like particular scene or game or what have you. And yeah. sometimes your audience will also not like it when you branch out and do other things. Right. So you you have to kind of like, it's like being typecasted as an actor almost. You have to kind of put in effort to not be typecasted mm -hmm. so that people get you and they understand that this is your agenda and like this is the kind of thing you're going to be doing. And if they can accept that, then it's like, yeah, fine. You're not going to get as much resistance. But some streamers and some content creators have a lot of pushback from their audiences when they try and do that. So maybe it is better for you to do that sooner rather than later, just so that there's less pushback and that you can like establish yourself and not get typecasted too much. You know what right. I mean? Well, that's why I wanted to do more feature videos. And at the beginning of the year, I told myself or I gave myself a goal of putting out a feature video every month but here we are in may and it's my first feature video of the year so um yeah i kind of yeah. i got kind of slowed down because i started streaming a lot but i'm kind of cutting back on that um we were doing like five days a week six days a week streaming we we're like doing maybe like two or three this month and we got a feature video out so i i, I like what you're saying i think it's better to to like branch out a little bit a little bit sooner um mm -hmm. and like feature videos i think are the way for me to utilize some of the the skills that i've learned from doing a lot of video editing um and to enhance those skills so like continue to hone that and also you know bring people into the brutal war space and grow the audience beyond uh just regular you know youtube or uh yeah. brutal war cast viewers do you know what i mean well, you can't really utilize your skill set through your other regular content with like your casting because most of that is the emphasis is on the actual casting itself, not mm -hmm. say your editing ability or what have you, or your ability to create a narrative or like, you know, mm -hmm. what have you, or digest something for the viewer. So, yeah, I feel like you're, I've seen the Pro League video and it's it's really really good it's it's concise it's informative and entertaining and it's to the point you know it's it's six minutes long it's a lot of videos you'll see they're like 10 20 30 minutes really long-winded really padded out content he's talking slowly there's moments of like dead air where it's just like fancy transitions or like some interesting or so-called interesting content on the screen for your eyeballs but yeah like i actually find it really hard to engage with it when it's like that but when it's like concise and there's a good pace to it where it's like almost like a rapper you know like there's a good flow mm. to the content and it's like once you get that sort of bouncy rhythm going it's like even someone with like adhd and really bad attention span is going to be able to latch on to what you're doing if you're doing it like that yeah that's the hope that's the hope we can get people to the end of the video um that's always the the struggle man with every youtube video is like most people tap out in the first uh 15 seconds you know <laughs> like almost yeah. Uh, depends on how good you are but um even if you are amazing at making a video most people are going to tap out before or like well 30 percent of people will tap out before 15 seconds even if it's and then, that's great that's like a good yeah. <laughs> level and a few but, more and a few more will tap out as the the minute progresses as mm -hmm. well like yes that's, that's the issue right yeah so uh, but the, it's a harsh reality, but that is how humans judge things. Like, say, if you wanted to judge a thousand books, 
like it'd be really difficult to like read every single book page front to cover right mm. but what you could do is say read the first 50 to 100 pages of every book and that would still give you a, a reasonable indicator of like the writing style and what have you of the author to actually kind of judge them a little bit and that's kind of like videos like they're, they're only gonna they're gonna judge you right what humans are very judgmental they're gonna be they're gonna take like one look at your video and within 10 20 seconds they've made their fucking mind up if they're interested or not yeah and the thing about youtube as well is that there's like a recommendation bar right next to the video so the moment people click on a video and they the new video loads in they like immediately their eyes go to the recommendation bar and if there's something more interesting that's what than what's on the screen at that moment they're just yeah. as likely to like click the next video <laughs> instead humans are fickle uh, creatures yeah. man it's it's for real you're you're competing with everything in the recommendation bar um for the person's attention so it's it's a tough you're game as a content creator, you're mm. now big enough that you realize that the reality of the situation is it's a war for attention. It, mm. it's, it's not about money. It's not about clickbait per se. The clickbait's only good because it's a battle for attention, right? Yeah. It's just part of the wider the wider struggle. And that's why people like XQC are so successful because he's obsessed with that. He's obsessed with that, I want all the eyeballs on me kind of mm. way of thinking. You know what I mean? And mm. they understand that. They know how to be goofy enough to be engaging enough to keep the eyeballs on them in every moment of their streaming and their content or whatever. Like They understand that engagement needs to be there always. There needs mm. to be a reason for you to be fucking looking at me. Mm. Well, it's funny. It's a war for attention and StarCraft is a war of attention, right? We are splitting mm. your attention between all mm. different types of things uh, that are going on your macro your micro um the drops that are coming in the the harassment that's going on um right i just i immediately yeah, but, drew that correlation when you were talking about the war for attention i think it's a great a great parallel and a great an, uh, analogy to that yeah like they are like two sides of the same coin yeah, it's it's your day, your whole day is a, a a war of attention, right? It's like, what am I gonna put my attention to? Am I gonna put it towards a video? Am I gonna put it towards a, a Netflix series, or am I gonna put it towards like building my relationships, uh -huh. or or progressing my career, or you know, working on my hobbies? Um, it's almost like your brain in, in the sense of your memory banks and mm. what you think about on a day-to-day -day basis is you can think of that as ad space and all the companies are fighting for ad space mm. so like the coca-cola company right like they're gonna like they've been around for such a long time that they've like they're like nestled in our subconsciousness you know like there's certain things that happen which will trigger you thinking about coca-cola or something you know what mm. i mean and, and that's what they're essentially doing they're fighting for that ad space in your mind your attention mm yeah they're they're fighting for your, your dollars as well trying to get that money um mm. yeah have you uh talking about um starcraft and uh fighting for your attention have you seen the new starcraft 2 versus starcraft 1 mod i know we talked about it before but let's talk about it again starcraft 2 versus starcraft <laughs> 1 dude that's wild like it's not balanced in the slightest, obviously, because it can't be because you were talking about the macro side of things and yeah, the units are just so wildly different. But I was saying that in a way you could use that kind of platform as a way of like balancing the skill disparity between two players. Say if you've got like a, a really good brood war player against kind of like an average Starcraft to your player, well, maybe they'll be slightly more evenly matched per se. Well, it's insane how evenly matched it felt when I was watching the AGSL, um, uh, the the Africa TV, um, alternate GSL, or like where they were playing the mod with all like the the pro players. There was like, who was playing action? No, not action. Who was it in there? No, action was in there. Um, Mini was in there. Mini was in there. Uh, Soul, Soul Key, Key. Ty. Uh, and then classic and dark, yeah. Um, and they were playing a bunch of games, and it went back and forth really, really heavily. A lot of the wins were on the side of Brood War. It was kind of crazy. And then you go ahead and watch like 
Artosis versus No Regret with No Regret playing StarCraft 2. It's like impossible to win. And I played <laughs> I played a bit of StarCraft 1 Zerg versus StarCraft 2 Terran on my stream and it was insanely difficult. Insanely difficult. Whoa. They just have so much macro uh, with the, the mules and, and injects and that. They can have so much um, just kind of muscle behind their army and then there's the the liberators are so incredibly broken and yeah. <laughs> the the drop ships are insane it's in, it, it is it is really kind of mind blowing just to think about like if in brood war you could have uh drop ships that were medics that would heal the the, <laughs> the you know yeah. what i mean and they come out within like just a couple of minutes it's wild GDP doesn't sound fun yeah no it's like instead of having, you know, a five minute marine medic push coming at you, it's five minute marine medic with dropship. It's kind of crazy because you could just completely go around all of the Zerg defenses. Yeah, it's kind of wild to think about. And I mean I, I guess I could make the joke that the reason why the brutal players were still taking games with them is because it's a harder game and that they're better players and that they're able to do multitasking and that sort of thing that the uh, StarCraft two pros can't do. Mm, well, they, there was StarCraft 1 pros who played a bit of StarCraft 2, but then, of course, the their StarCraft 1, like, they don't maybe necessarily know how um, to abuse how to the StarCraft 2 units or whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah. there was a bit of that going on, and then um, there was also that sort of uh, kind of pro gamer, really early game pressure stuff that came out as well, like, they were hitting like these really, really sharp timings with, you know, a very early few dragoons and a reaver and like trying to to bust open a StarCraft two player. And the, the reavers are crazy in that as well. Like uh -huh. they do so much damage, of course, but they the the scarab connects insanely well. It never misses. So it's really, really strong and uh -huh. and fast to use. So they were kind of abusing that and getting some good value out of it and, and taking some wins. So um, there were some of those mechanics that made it a little easier to play Brood War, but uh, overall it felt like the StarCraft II like, macro engine was just so much better. Yeah, I can see that. I can see the games being like way more StarCraft two-sided the longer the game goes on mm -hmm. just because of how crazy the, the macro features are for those respective races. Whereas Brood War actually like maybe has a few power spikes in like the early to early mid game where mm -hmm. maybe they can get one over the start of two guys. Yeah, but just imagine, uh, uh, just 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 imagine for a second like a StarCraft two Terran versus a StarCraft mm -hmm. one Zerg. Um, first of all, you've got the the Metavax, right? So uh, as soon as you get out on the field, um, there's going to be Metavax, of course. At the beginning of the game, you can get Lings out a lot faster as the the StarCraft One Zerg player, but there's supply depots that go up and down, so they can block you off, right? You can't get in, and you right. can't bust because you don't have uh uh veinlings. Veinlings, you don't have veinlings. So, um, the StarCraft Two player comes out with the Marine and Medivac. You can't defend with sunken colonies because they can just go mm -hmm. around it. You don't have queens, so you can't shoot down the the um, medivacs, and then so they they can harass you. You have to build a lot of stuff to defend against that, and then liberators can fly in at like four minutes and set you up. Can't even and have can't, the urge to deal with that. <laughs> you have to have you have to have um, either a spore ready or you have to have a spire done by that time and it's really really close in the timings like i was doing one base uh, to get to spire fast enough to to deal with liberator no, it's kind of it's so bad man <laughs> having to play one base though yeah you have to you have to get scourged because you can't handle metavax just picking stuff up and flying around everywhere or liberators mm -hmm. coming in and just shutting down your economy instantly so yeah it, it's it's an interesting experiment but I definitely don't think it's balanced. Maybe, you know what? I was thinking, and I actually wrote this in their Discord, I thought that it might be better if um, the StarCraft 1 units returned 8 minerals instead of 5 to make it like more balanced with the, the macro. 
hacks that StarCraft One has or StarCraft Two has. That'd be interesting. As long as it doesn't completely break the early game, that might be an idea. Yeah, I don't know what it what it'll do, but um, could be interesting if they just keep messing around with it. They might hit like a a cool medium. You know, they might hit some sort of level where. I mean. It it to be honest though like they were struggling to balance starcraft 2 <laughs> alone you know what i mean I know, so like I know. how are they gonna balance starcraft 2 versus starcraft 1 i mean have fun with that if they can figure that out i'm gonna be like well how did you not manage to fix starcraft 2 all this time <laughs> yeah well maybe they'll they'll get it to like a more playable level and we'll have like more tournaments and stuff that might be something fun if it really becomes like a a popular um thing in the future like it, it's hitting like a spike of popularity right now of course a yeah. lot of people are watching videos about it and stuff um well they but... they did recently make the balancing of starcraft 2 community led yeah. so there has been there has been a, a spark of interest back into starcraft 2 because yeah. like there seems to be a little bit of life breathed into it from that sense so mm -hmm. maybe yeah maybe there's going to be a bit of an uptick and people eyeballs on stuff that kind of content yeah, that might be a, a place to, to kind of grow into, possibly, uh, if they really, um, if the interest, like, picks up and and stays in that StarCraft 1 versus StarCraft 2 mod, it might be fun to to grow into that area, but um, I don't know. It seems really broken right now. <laughs> it seems, like, crazy broken, so... Uh, but also... Yeah. The, the lack of jankiness, like say the Reaver Scarabs connect mm. well, but but also inversely, like say Mutalisk Micro, like you, I'm I'm guessing you can't abuse Bio with Muters quite no. as easily. You can't, and uh, Vultures are terrible. They don't micro at all. Um, they don't oh. slide. You know what I mean? So you right. can't you can't like flick micro them. Uh, they just kind of stop turn and fire and then move and then stop and then turn you know what i mean and sure it's really uh, really bad <laughs> it's yeah, god awful good. so yeah Eesh. yeah it's it's got some it's got a ways to go they need to add some of those things in for sure that's interesting concepts like mm. the fact that it's even remotely balanced where both sides can win is interesting yeah yeah it's not something I ever considered as like a possibility that they would do that. <laughs> like, of course, <laughs> of course they wouldn't do that. That's just silliness. Yeah. yeah but somehow they've oh. kind of put it together. Have you seen, have you seen the, uh, the, uh, devour or oh. not devour, um, defiler in that mod? Oh, no. Oh, it's so no. silly. It looks like a lobster. <laughs> <laughs> it really looks like a lobster shin, I'm i mean I have, to, I, I have to say like defilers are the most crustacean of all the zerg units mm, maybe yeah it it's it's frankly just ridiculous looking i want to bring it up on screen right now i don't have a, <laughs> i don't have a, a image of it though on my computer or anything like that it's it's very silly we'll have to play it sometime yeah. shouldn't let's let's do it sometime yeah, we'll play sure. Sure. play and mess around bring we'll up, take turns maybe for... <laughs> playing starcraft 2 maybe for the viewer like just you know post edit bring up a little picture of it or something so they can see it all right if i remember i'll do that for sure otherwise we'll play it they can they can check right. out the stream or something sounds um, good yeah i might do some videos on that that'll be interesting i don't know where to get uh replays for it though a uh, little bit tough to find a replay for that um it's already difficult enough to even find a game it's kind of crazy how few games there are in starcraft 2 if you go into the game i haven't played it for like seven years but i went into oh. starcraft 2 to play the mod and there's almost no custom games kind of wild there's like maybe you know five ten custom games open at any really? given time and you go on brood war uh you know us west there's more and then if you go to korea it's like oh, it's 10 loads. times more yeah yeah it's wild really wild there's some yeah the, the the community that play ums maps are actually pretty popular in korea in brood war still yeah. it always has been that way like there's always been like a dedicated ums community in brood war but mm. still seems like alive and kicking even to this day 
Yeah. Yeah, you can go in and you can get a game anytime um, for Brutal War. Um, 1v1, 3v3, some UMS. It's Which is uh, wild to think about. Yeah, it's just wild, actually. Um, I still keep playing it, too. I get in there and play, like, uh, uh, cat and mouse or, like, 2v2s <laughs> or, like, just silly shit sometimes. Poker yeah. defense or whatever. Every once in yeah, a while. Same. Every, every once in a while, someone recognizes me. And they're like, are you that guy? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. It's weird that I'm in here, yes. But <laughs> I do like these yeah. UMS sometimes. Since doing the KCM with you, like I got a little bit of that as well. Oh, really? People, if, like, only if I'm on my other account, because usually I'm on like Sausage Monkey or something, mm. so I won't get it. But if I'm on like a, an actual Jean account, then yeah, I've gotten that a few times. We're like, are you the guy at Curse of Saiyan? That's funny. Yeah, I can't remember the first time that happened to me, but it was um, kind of crazy. I mean, we're we're like almost a little bit famous in such a small subcategory of <laughs> yeah. such a tiny game. Like even even Artosis, I mean, is not crazy famous. You know, he's famous for us, but I, I'm, he's not in the wider right zeitgeist actually that famous, right? But he's still like a hundred times more famous than us. It's just oh yeah, absolutely it's just funny. It's funny the levels of fame and like the. <laughs> Yeah, the 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 sort of weirdness of just like people knowing you. Um, I can't imagine being someone like Brad Pitt or something like that. Can you imagine? Oh, please oh no! Gosh. Can you imagine? Can you imagine like not even be able to like just go anywhere? Yeah, like everybody knows you from a million different things. They recognize you as soon as they see you. And you're just looking at strangers all the time. So weird. If you do go outside, you have to essentially wear a disguise, like you know, a hat, and like have a like have a different get up, like have a beard if you're usually clean shaven or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like you know what I mean? Right. Wear a wig or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So fuck weird. that, dude. So nah, weird. I'm not about it. Uh, I don't know why they don't move to like Japan or something. You know, move to China or something. Somewhere where they don't, they like, don't have any they, idea where what you you know. Because they look the same as any other white person to them. <laughs> sure, sure. That that and also like they just they don't watch the same shit, right? Like most of them they don't they don't watch that shit. So they probably won't even yeah, recognize true. you. It's that's actually like a big thing for YouTubers. Like really famous YouTubers will move to, to Japan or whatever because they don't watch English YouTube. Maybe they'll watch like yeah, uh when... Hollywood movies and they might notice like a Brad right. Pitt or whatever, but like a uh, PewDiePie lives in in Japan, and like fuck, nobody's gonna know who he who he is, right? Like, I mean, imagine a couple nobody. might recognize him, but the the most people, yeah, the, like his chances of being recognized like go down from like eighty percent to like one percent or something. You yeah, know? yeah. So it becomes much more bearable, I'm sure, for him to be living over here instead of back in his home country, especially his home country. Holy crap, I can't imagine. He's really popular. Yeah. 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 I saw him doing some like rock climbing content recently or something. He looked pretty ripped in that. I think he, he just does whatever the, the hell he wants, man. Pretty much anything. Yeah, he's living the dream now, dude. Yeah. He can pretty much do whatever he wants. He can coast on his his success. Unless he makes... I mean, let's be honest. The guy survived some pretty big scandals as well, right? Mm. Like, he is not much that can happen now that is going to really upset the th unless he it turned out he was like i don't know <laughs> he had, he'd have to do some pretty pretty bad stuff i think to get yeah. like you know cancelled yeah and even then i mean he's got enough money i'm sure that yeah. he's coasting like on interest whatever interest is incurring occurring off of what is what he's got banked up now sure yeah i'm sure he's well. been and he, and he's not stupid. He's probably got like money in crypto, money here and there. Like he's got money everywhere. Like you know, his portfolio is probably diverse as anything. Mm, yeah, I mean, you would hire someone like a finance guy to figure that shit out if you had that mm. much money. I'm sure. Yeah. Doesn't have to think about it. Just hope he doesn't. Uh, that's always like the scary thing, though, is if you get that wealthy, um, trusting somebody to put your money in investments you know yeah. like you get like a business manager or something like that there's so many stories of them just like 
taking all your money and just well, yeah, it's kind of like off. It's, that's what that's just kind of like happens in like any kind of especially i think the most the most n notorious is probably boxing like mm. because like it's a perfect combination of like a fighter that doesn't really care about the finance system or how economics work or anything he just wants yeah. to fight and be a champion or whatever and and then you've got the greedy manager that's just going to take advantage of that it's like the perfect situation to do that kind of corruption right but you see that in the wider world in other capacities as well well i think youtubers the new one the new boxer you know like these yeah. youtubers who are making huge amounts of money they don't know what to do with it they might be just some like muckbanger dumbass like doesn't know anything <laughs> right they're like what do i do with all this money well you give it to me and then i invest it for you and then they're freaking gone they've taken it all yeah this yeah. type of shit yeah, that's, or they that's... tell you, or they, or they tell you that they put it into some crypto that got rug pulled or something, and like right. make it seem like your money got lost or something. Yeah, yeah, disappear your money. Scary. That's. I mean, yeah, I don't have those problems. <laughs> don't have to worry about that yet. <laughs> you don't have those kinds of first world problems yet. Yeah, don't have those type of problems yet. Still got a long way to go. <laughs> yeah, you got a long way to go before you can get that kind of drama. <laughs> I'm looking I'm looking forward to having those problems. Yeah, right. I want to have those kind of problems of having too much money. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, a lot of people don't know this. I actually have a finance degree, so I I don't know. I I'll probably just manage my own accounts. Figure that shit out. Yeah. yeah. Time would be the issue though. Yeah, true. Or at least but, but the the literacy of knowing the finance would help you in avoiding being like manipulated or taken true, advantage true. of. Uh, yeah. You you would you still Hire need someone. to delegate. You you could oversee it though. You could yeah. oversee the, the accounts, just true, just true. have it delegated, right? Yeah, that would make more sense probably. Um just spend spend my time thinking about how to make the next video rather than thinking about what to yeah. do with the money. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, there's we can always dream, Shun. We can always dream. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to stay alive right now. Just trying to make it happen. Hustling. I, I, I thought it's it's interesting because um you said about how like mm -hmm. these people like they don't really know what they're doing. They just get so big, like almost too big to ha to handle themselves. Mm -hmm. But uh, one one thing I thought was interesting XQC's approach, as far as I'm aware, I don't know if it's still the case, but what he did was he basically gave his YouTube channel to his editor and basically said, like, the money you make from here is yours. Just, you know, then he's incentivized to, like, put out the best possible content and edits on that channel because it's all him. Like, he's making all the editors, making all the money. It's just that X but XQC's face is all over it, mm. right? All the eyeballs are on XQC. XQC's still making crazy bank from his stream and whatever else he's got going on, right? Right. I thought that was an interesting approach to be like, hey, editor, the account is actually yours. And then it's like, then the editor's incentive to like do the best possible shit, right? He's making all mm. the money. Hmm. He's missing out on a lot of cash. <laughs> the YouTube money I, I, is probably the best. Um, I don't know. I don't know exactly the, what he's got going on, but that's how I thought he had it set up a few years ago. I'm not sure if he's still doing that. That's wild. But I heard that yeah. uh, Asmon Gold, um, for him, he just doesn't even um, monetize his Twitch account. He's just well, unmonetized he on Twitch. Money. He he's, spends yeah. like one percent of what he makes. Yeah. Like, and he lived in the. He's not even moved. He's lived in the same house yeah. his entire life, yeah. and that's basically his entire personality. His mm. living arrangement is his personality <laughs> in a sense. So, for him to increase his quality of living. As far as he's concerned, maybe it is, there's some truth to it. Would also kill his branding and like his identity right. as well. Maybe so it's, he's kind of tied into that, but it is affecting his health. I mean, the guy's breathing in fucking mold for Christ's sake. Probably, probably, yeah. Um, but he makes all of his money from YouTube because mm. he he just doesn't even monetize himself on Twitch. I I <laughs> I remember watching a video where he pulled up the amount of money like they were figuring out how much money does it cost to stream um like 
server fees for Twitch, and he found out he was uh, actively losing like some ungodly amount of money for Twitch. Yeah, Twitch was yeah. losing like ten thousand uh, dollars an hour or something like that for yeah. just him streaming <laughs> something stupid like that um, because he wasn't monetized. They weren't able to sell ads on on his stream, so <laughs> it's just a big nice. fat minus. Um, from nice. him streaming, pretty hilarious. But, um, yeah, he Take doesn't it. need money. Fucking guy just eating two dollar steaks and uh, living in his yeah. his mom's house. Pretty hilarious. It's, it's really it's really crazy to think about. Like that guy has so much money and just doesn't care about it. Like in a way, I admire it. In a way, mm. I love the. I just wish he didn't. It's unfortunate that his branding is is be a detriment to his health you know mm. i mean that's the only thing i'm concerned about the same way i'd be concerned about someone like nick Ar avocado like eating oh, himself yeah. into an early grave right. you know what i mean like it's like when you make something part of your image that's that de detrimental to your health i think we got problems mm. it's like a modern day epictetus or something like that you know like epictetus the uh greek philosopher who lived like a hobo and mm. even though everybody in Rome wanted him to, you know, he's getting offers from uh, emperors to come and, you know, stay at their uh, their villas and stuff to to teach them philosophy. He's just like, nah, I'd rather, you know, piss in the street and drink from the gutter. <laughs> well, he's, he's, he's the the hobo Buddha. I mean, that's just yeah. what Buddha does. Buddha gives up his worldly possessions mm -hmm. and travels the world and just walks the streets yeah doesn't care about your luxury and your comfy beds and he wants to live as a, live as a beast but not in the sense of like live like an animal mm -hmm. but like live authentically human and right. not be tied down to any kind of worldly possessions right and he like the the i think the thinking from epictetus was like if i have those things then those things are going to hold me back right like things that you have that you own and the boning you so like if i stay at your villa then you have power over me right. and i don't want exactly. anyone to have power over me i want to be completely free so it was all about yeah. like freedom and like the mindset of being you know lowering the amount of things that he needs in order to be happy and to be free so and yeah. i know it's, yeah i think i talked about in a previous podcast episode like um even in my experience when i was like homeless at one point like i actually ironically felt in a way more empowered and more free than i'd ever felt before mm. like once you really don't give a fuck and you have nothing and you are basically just roaming the land like in a way yeah like there's no bigger sense of freedom in that sleeping out under the stars yeah right well we were gonna discuss um the the aurora borealis story that uh happened this month Ooh. I yeah. saw like everybody on my Facebook and uh, Instagram was posting about this Aurora Borealis. It's like the biggest one I've ever heard of in mm -hmm. um, British Columbia. And, and I guess you saw it or you, you heard about it too. Yeah, well, it was as far as usually it only hits like the northern parts of Scotland. Um, but this time it went all the way down to southern England, even where I'm at. I actually didn't see it with my own eyeballs but yeah um but yes it was really far reaching down here and um very unusual like the, the magnetic poles of the sun flip every um 11 years and uh, the sunspot allegedly was you know kicking out enough coronal mass ejections i think um five i think was the amount of ejections that they said and that's what is uh, hitting hitting the earth's um magnetic field with like uh, gas and what have you which is like you know a solar storm which is causing this uh, light show so to speak but there was some conspiracies right regarding heart yeah there's like some sort of um uh, testing that was supposed to be going on in the exact same day as the aurora borealis happened and they were uh doing uh these tests with the ionosphere which is right. oddly timed and like very uh what's it called coincidental uh that they were doing this big test with the uh, 
this energy field that they were going to use on the ionosphere to to test. I, I can't remember what they were testing for, but uh, I think I've got the the web page up here. Let me just pull it up for you guys. Mm -hmm. But while um, you're pulling that up, I just want to point out to anyone that's listening right now, we are still scheduled for more activity because um, the Sunspot cluster is going to roll back around to us in about two weeks-ish time from now. Mm -hmm. So okay. keep your eyes out, guys, because you can maybe have another chance to see some lights. Yeah, so here it is. Um, the experiment fuels claims. This is this is the fact check. They, they're they saying in the fact check that it's total uh, total BS that it's not. Um, but this is based on HARP, like HARP, the uh, government... Um, what is it called? Like uh, organization um, said that oh no, that's our our testing is not powerful enough to create something like that. So that that's what the a the the fact check is just saying is that it's um it's debunked based on what Harp says. But um, right, well, just 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 so mm -hmm. the listeners know, Harp is basically um high frequency active aural research program. Um, and it directs like 3.6 megawatt signals in the 2.8 to 10 megahertz uh, range um, of the HF band into the ionosphere. So that's why there's these conspiracy theories. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they did it on exactly the same day here. It says May uh, 8th to 10th. And here's the ARP program transmission notice. So they were definitely doing testing uh, in the what was it was it on the 8th that the um that the, not, I, I think uh, so um that, that, that there was this check. big uh, aurora but look they were doing it at night right between 8 p.m and 2 a.m it's like right around the time when this this actually happened uh when, just before like a couple of days before i noticed the activity anyway mm, so it's just it, it is interesting that they would decide to do it on at the same time as the coronal mass ejection right or they didn't decide to do it at that time um the same as the coronal mass ejection that they just happened to be doing it at the same time it's kind well, of interesting if, if, if i'm being if i'm being open-minded but not so much that my brain falls out i could make the argument that much like a sniper would want to disguise the sound of his gunshots by firing in time with the sound of bombs going off they may have um timed this project or whatever research or test whatever they were doing with this event to kind of disguise maybe the effects of what they were testing who knows mm, well yeah for me uh from from my like I, I really don't know anything about this but i would think that as a, like a scientist you would want to set up an experiment that doesn't have a lot of interference so why right. would you be doing an experiment like this at exactly the same time as a coronal mass ejection that just seems or maybe maybe to see if they were able to amplify the effects mm, yeah if they're doing something like that that would make sense but it just seems like if they if they didn't have anything to do with uh you know like amplifying or you know they're not like uh creating the aurora borealis or whatever why would they ever do it at the same time as the as the the coronal mass ejection um because it would totally mess with their experiment you know what i yeah, mean if they if they if the goal was to yeah get clean data yeah so to speak then they wouldn't however if the experiment was based around their ability to interfere amplify manipulate or mess in any way with this event because it, it could be that the test was specifically during an event like this if that makes mm. sense like the whole point of the test could have been to research what would happen if we did this while this event was occurring right so that might be the real conspiracy right that might be the real thing is like they're trying to figure out what happens if they mess around with the ionosphere while a corona mass ejection is happening Exactly. Yeah. That'd be my speculation. If mm. that was any, if there was any validity to it, that'd be my postulation. Yeah. Right. So, 
I don't know. It's a, it's just an interesting topic. I thought it was super cool, like the the videos that came out of my hometown where I've n never ever seen uh, aurora borealis, even a tiny tiny one. My entire life was like massive. Looked like uh you know front someone in Alaska would be seeing was right outside my parents' house. It was crazy wow. crazy bright. So that was just really really wild to me that that even happened and uh that the government has something that might have something to do with it it's kind of a, a tick a, <laughs> a fun fun topic to talk about anyway yeah well i just want to point out to people that might be skeptical about that i'm not trying to say that this is happening and these conspiracy theories are real probably 99 plus percent of conspiracies are bullshit but one thing i'd like to point out to people is that we've been cloud seeding and manipulating the weather for many, 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 many decades already. So it's not like this kind of thing is like completely in la la land. No, and people people are driven by curiosity. If they can do it, if they can try to do it, I'm sure that they're gonna try and do it. Um whether that's manipulating clouds or uh cloud seeding or or aurora borealis. I was I was just thinking if um this was like civil or uh, civilizations like the video uh, the video game then yeah. um controlling the aurora borealis would be like a morale boost for your civilization you know what i mean like you, <laughs> <laughs> you research you get oh. the research you know and you get cloud seeding or whatever and like one of the bonuses <laughs> is you know every once in a while you can trigger an aurora borealis and and everyone gets like a golden age or something like that <laughs> or a, really, a, really an energy like boost <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> but also, also the, the the reason could have been, what if the reason was to actually be able to protect our um, magnetic field, or at least like be able to manipulate it enough, like say say in the event of a really strong solar storm, is there mm -hmm. any way we can make it so that the the adverse effects are not too great, where there's less chance of it knocking out satellites and GPS systems and what have you? Like they're already got some satellites up there right now which have shielding against this kind of stuff, and maybe mm -hmm. they want to experiment of other ways of protecting the the magnetic field of the planet or what have you and they're just trying to experiment with like different ways they can influence that i think the the satellites are on their own but maybe they could find some way to protect things down here on the ground yeah i wonder I yeah wonder. that that would be the idea yeah because yeah. they, they might be able to have it so that satellites are either fried no matter what or they can put shielding on them or something but then, then they might want to think hang on a minute is there anything we can do with actually the magnetic field of the earth itself can right we can we make that stronger and more resilient? Can we stop that from fucking up our systems down on Earth or what? Yeah, that would be wild. That would be really interesting. I was hearing about or seeing some uh, videos about how in like the 50s there was a massive coronal ejection that uh, sunspot that wiped out like all the telegram lines um, yeah. during this one event. And they were talking about how devastating that would be to the world uh, should that happen today. And yeah, I think that's like one of those well, things. Unironically, unironically, that could wipe out civilization though, right? Yeah, like that... something that's that powerful just takes all this, everything out. And there's yeah. no GPS, there's no communication, there's no... Farming we're equipment. Just fucked. <laughs> we're, we're fucked. Yeah. Like, like 98% of the planet is probably dead within like a few months maybe maybe like at that point i don't know but that would be one of those like really weird um unexpected turns for a civilization like oh yeah you might blow yourselves up you might like run out of space or like you know the the soil could you know dry out or something like that of all like the sci-fi and apocalypse scenarios it could play out um the coronal mass ejection one is kind of like a funny left field type of like strange way to end the the civilization yeah. but that's probably how we'll go something something that no one is expecting everyone's thinking like oh boy ai is gonna you know <laughs> kill us mm -hmm. all or whatever it's probably just gonna be like a sunspot <laughs> or of course 
uh, everyone, oh, an asteroid's going to hit us. It's like, eh, well, maybe just well, some magnetic yeah. charge <laughs> it just hits us. <laughs> it's like the, yeah, these are like the many great filters we've got to pass through just to exist. Yeah. So, I mean, like, it's a, every day is a miracle, guys, unironically. Like, mm. live each day like it's your last because it might actually be. That's a funny thing about um, Elon Musk going to to Mars. Like we get a a base on Mars or whatever. Like oh yeah, now we're we're safe from, um, you know, a catastrophic event killing the entire civilization. But then there's like a sunspot that just knocks out all the power. You're so dead on Mars. You're so dead. <laughs> <laughs> it just wipes out all the power in the entire solar system. No oh, man, yeah. Like, like if they say like um, a pulsar or something, like a black hole that shoots out like two mm. massive like jets of like crazy high intensity light and energy. Like, yeah, we could just get unlucky enough that that hits us and we just literally like vaporized. Ugh. Yeah, there's there's too much, too many unknowns out there in the universe. It's crazy. It's hard yeah. to it's hard to think about all that. And then it's like that we're even here to to be able to think about that is what's fascinating that we have gone through right. all those great fillers. It makes you wonder if the simulation theory is more accurate where it's like hang on a minute there's too many coincidences here guys like how is it that the the moon is 400 times closer than the sun but also perfectly 400 like um less or whatever like it's positioned in such a way that it's the perfect size of the sun in the sky so it creates a perfect solar eclipse do you know how fucking rare solar eclipses are guys really mm. fucking rare that it happens to be that the, the moon is that perfect distance from the earth because here's another thing guys the moon isn't stationary as in it, it was it used to be a lot closer to the earth and it's moving further away mm. right so not only is it crazy that that happened, but it's crazy that right now it's that distance that we are now here to witness at that distance and be able to see a, a, a solar eclipse because, say, a few tens of thousands of years in the future won't quite be as perfect anymore. Right. So it might have like more of a yellow ring around it. Like the sun will be more visible yeah. behind the moon when yeah. it eclipses. Because the moon is very slowly slipping away from... Uh, ever so I, slowly. I actually didn't know that that the moon is going farther away. I've never heard about it, it's that. It's not much. It's not by much. It's only by a tiny amount. But mm. as the years tick on, that'll that'll add up. It'll add up and it'll get worse, right? Because it'll be less and less affected by our gravity. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's interesting. I wonder it's what. It's interesting kind of... that we're alive right now. That it's the perfect distance to be a, a solar eclipse. Isn't that wild, guys? That is you, wild. You, you must be you must be living in the simulation, guys. Right? Can't be that. Or or in, if the simulation's not true, maybe it's the alien theory of like you know, the for example, the moon is nowhere near as heavy as it should be given its size and composition. You know what I mean? I'm not necessarily saying it's hollow and aliens live inside of it. I'm not going that crazy, but in the sense of like it could be artificial or manipulated in some way to to be that way to like terraform the planet because you know wh wh how, what do you think controls the tides the moon is extremely important to life being stable here on earth so it is entirely possible that this planet was terraformed and the moon was manipulated or put into position or in some way to to create that terraforming effect where it created stable enough conditions for life to even be here to think about this right now Okay, I just looked this up, guys. I'm going to bring it up on screen. Will the moon eventually leave the Earth's orbit? Technically never, but it says um, due to the tidal forces is being pushed away from Earth at a rate of around a few centimeters each year, <laughs> meaning that yeah. it, in around 50 billion years it'll escape. So it's it's not going to happen anytime soon. That's That's... That's kind of funny. It won't escape the orbit anytime soon, but it will be drifting further and further right, right, away. Right. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> now think about how long the Earth's been around for. How many billion years has the Earth been around for? I actually can't remember. Was it five? No. Five billion? No, quickly, quickly look it up. 
Now, now think about that. Now think about the Earth's been around for this Four, long. Four point five. The, so, the solar close. system used. The solar system used to be so chaotic that life couldn't even exist here. But but we got lucky, and Jupiter basically cleaned up the entire solar system. Like Jupiter, even though it's like a gas planet, like you could if if you could have a if you could have a spaceship that was sufficiently enough should, could resist the heat and the pressure of being inside that gas giant, you could actually fly through Jupiter. But the problem is, is that the pressure is so great and there's actually like pockets of really intense heat in there. So you'd have to somehow be able to withstand that. And most vessels that we could create, even like now and in a thousand years time, probably couldn't do that. But yeah, even though that it's just made out of gas, essentially, just pure hydrogen almost, like that fucking thing literally cleared up the entire solar system. Like the solar system was one big fucking shit show once mm -hmm. upon a time. Yeah, and Jupiter cleared it all up for us. Yeah, super lucky. That's like body blocking for us. It's like standing in the wall, keeping the lings out, just preventing us from getting <laughs> rushed and smoked. Yeah, it's um, it's a weird like gold Goldilocks kind of uh, almost seems situation. too convenient, right? Yeah, it's pretty convenient. Now so so obviously obviously you can speculate aliens you can speculate simulation theory you can speculate so many things based on that but the argument against that is obviously well the only reason that you're even there to contemplate that is because yeah we got lucky enough to be here in the first exactly. place to even exactly. contemplate that and that's that's the only reason why we can think about that is because we got that fucking lucky yeah uh, i heard about uh them finding a planet um that's even more like goldilocks than our planet that's like even better for life um mm. a few light years away i can't remember where it's at but uh it's like ac so light years away and yeah the what's it called the the gas which um signifies life is way higher concentration mm -hmm. than here on earth yeah which would indicate a strong possibility of not only supporting life but maybe thriving even more than here on earth right that's what we should be trying to do really if we're um, thinking from like a um, civilizational point of view is our whole goal should just be trying to make our earth as habitable as pop possible you know what i mean like if we're going to be changing things which we're already we're already changing a lot about the earth you know um in terms of like its its structure its atmosphere everything is being changed but uh, we really should have that with like that massive that that like one goal in mind. You know what is the best thing for habit like to make the Earth the most habitable as possible. That should be the mm. ultimate goal, right? Ooh, it depends on what the incentive is. If your incentive is purely based on like um, preservation of the, um, the the human race or what have you then yeah obviously but as far as the earth's concerned the earth doesn't give a fuck like no. what we're doing is a, a blink in the eye of its existence it will be here long before and after we're gone mm -hmm. and um it doesn't give a fuck about us like no. it will shake us off like george carlin says like a case of bad fleas when it wants to in the, mm -hmm. in using super volcanoes and what other craziness to get rid of us you know what i mean yeah yeah it does, sure. it does, in the grand scheme of things it doesn't give a fuck about some surface nuisance like us no that's the silly thing about like these people who are really like we have to protect the earth you know the earth is dying it's like yeah, earth, bitch, the earth thing <laughs> the earth ain't going <laughs> <Yeah>. nowhere <laughs> we are <laughs> yeah we're, we're we're gonna fall off yeah it's humanitarian perspective like we're we're trying to live yeah. on this thing yeah. It'll be the Earth plus plastic, like George Connor says. <laughs> uh, what a weird foreign material that is. I did check in on um that guy we talked about before who was doing the plastic to fuel reactor. He still hasn't done a video that I've seen where he burns the plastic for like a generator. Do you know what I mean? To like look yeah. back on itself so that he's he won't you know making plastic making fuel to like using I the energy to to power uh, the machine but yeah I, I doubt he's gonna get anywhere close to doing that anytime soon maybe not i'd I don't be know. amazed and if he does I'd, I'd i'd be skeptical that the the video was faked you know mm. what I mean? 
I'd want some other independent people there on site that have nothing to do with him verifying all that. Right. Yeah, that would be tough to do. That, um, mm. That's an interesting idea. It's fun to watch. I think it gives a lot of people hope for the future. Yeah, but I'm wondering if that's an issue or not. Like, is it just hope porn at this point? If, like, <laughs> we're not actually really doing anything with it. It's just like, oh, yeah, I feel good about myself now. There's people out there burning plastic and making fuel out of it. Like, I don't feel so bad about going out and buying Starbucks and getting single-use wrapped plastic wrapped shit at my convenience store or whatever. Like, yeah, people don't give a fuck, dude. They like to feel good. They like to, to think that they give a fuck. They like the feeling of giving a fuck without actually having to give a fuck. You know what I mean? That should be a, a new segment for us, dude. We'll do a, a segment in this podcast called Hope Porn. let's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. talk about what like feel good story is out right now where they're like trying to you know people are oh, glommed God. onto it because it sounds good but it's not you know practical or whatever be funny. i mean unironically hope is both our biggest strength and weakness as humanity i think mm. like it's our biggest pitfall as well as our biggest driving force yeah if you have hope that something's going to happen, uh, it can really like uh, drive you and motivate you, but it can also kind of like take away your willingness to adapt and change. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you're just yeah. like, I'll just hold on to hope that this is going to happen on its own. You know what I mean? Then... And, and, and literally like waiting for life to happen to them. Like I'm yeah. going to hold, uh, yeah. Like, like, and it's like, the it's like a, at that point it becomes more faith based mm. and it's like, but but you don't have to hope for the better. You right. can create the better, mm. or like you know, you can you can put that into action. It, it, you can hope hope for a better day while also putting into action the plans to have a better day. You can do both. You can, yeah. but to just hope and sit and like yeah, like waiting for life to happen to you rather than you happening to life. I, I think that's a big mistake. You got to make your own luck. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And people get dealt shitty cards all the time, man. And it's just about playing the position and playing the hand the best way you can sometimes. And sometimes you can create your own luck. And you should look for those opportunities or create those opportunities. Uh, there's nothing fucking sadder than someone who's working at a job that they hate and just praying that they're going to win the lottery. You know? They're just like, yeah. they're playing the, the, the scratchums every day or, you know, multiple times per day or... Well, I would argue oh, that they're God, a, it's so sad. They're like a they're like a gambling addict that's not addicted to the gambling, but they're addicted to that feeling of hope. They're addicted to the familiarity of being in poverty or being in a bad state of affairs. But they like that, like, oh, maybe one day I'll get my break. And it's like almost an addictive, intoxicating thing because it's like it absolves them of responsibility as well and that's very enticing to people like if you can give give someone an angle which absolves them that's why you see a lot of like this weird culture in the west where there's a lot of like middle class white people that feel guilty as fuck and they don't even know why they feel guilty as fuck they probably feel guilty as fuck because they're spending loads of money and they're, they're living these lifestyles and there's people out there really fucking struggling but they can't even like have the introspection to think about that because they don't know what it's like to live like that so instead they feel guilty from like a, a racial point of view like they have like privilege like so when they see What's so ironic about it is it's the most racist fucking bullshit you can think of because when they see, say, a um, an African American that's acting like like he's having a voice but is acting in a stereotypical way, they will be more receptive to that because they're racist and see things in a stereotypical way. They give more attention and more credibility to the most stereotypical and pandering of voices out there so it creates this really weird feedback loop echo chamber of just it's tolerance it's, it's, it's intolerance under the guise of tolerance and it's fucking maddening it's i know exactly what you're talking about and i the best example i can even think of is uh it, it really just almost perfectly exemplifies the state of uh, how people like this are just completely um, mindless 
and completely like absorbed into the cult. Like they're everywhere. Is Joe Biden yeah. when he said like, "If you vote for a Trump, you ain't black." That <laughs> you remember Fucking that? Hell, man. You ain't black, dude. This shit. It just you can't make this shit up. Like this is the Jeez. most racist, um, kind of like. Oh, exactly what you're talking about. Like type typing people, you know what I mean? Like black people believe this thing and that's yeah. how black people act. And then, you know, if you vote fucking for this hell. person instead of this person, you ain't black. Like that is so fucking racist and just stupid. And it, it just completely like the, the fact, you know, there, there was a hilarious, there, there's a really, kind of ironic thing that happened when Trump was president where people were like, oh, because Trump is president, now it's okay to be like an asshole. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's what a lot of people <laughs> were saying. Like, right. in America and in the West, there was like kind of like a like a green light for people to be kind of asshole-ish. Do you know what I mean? And a yeah. lot of people were making that argument. I'm not making that argument, but a lot of people were making that argument um, when Joe Biden is in office, it's like that sort of, uh, you know, virtue signaling, um, white privilege, uh, white person, uh, that sort of is now acceptable. Do you know what I mean? Because the president is doing yeah. it. The president is pushing it. There's a you green light I mean? on that now. There's it's a green like the light. Thing, yeah. the exactly. Yeah. It's not even in, it's it. it's not even inverse. Like it's funny how people like to put them on like different sides of the coin. Do you know what I mean? It's not like it's they're the same thing, they're not the packaging. opposite. They're just no. they're just doing it for a different cause. Do you know what I mean? They're both yeah. They're doing it in different ways, but it's it's not inverse. It's not opposite. No, you're right. The only way it is inverse is it's just like two sides of the same coin. That's the only inverse going on there. It's the exact same thing. Mm. That's, yeah, it's freaking weird, man. It's really strange. This this next election is going to be so psycho. I just, I you know, I remember being in, uh, I was living in China when there was uh, the Trump, the first Trump election, and watching man. that was madness. It was so insane. Like, um, I was on 4chan a lot at that time. I was just kind of fucking around and like, you know, just being young, like, tw what was I? How old was I? Was that 2000? No, when, when, when was Trump elected? You would have been remember. about 24 or something. 25, something like that. And, um, yeah, watching that was one of the craziest shit shows I've ever seen. And I just feel like since then, it's just gotten more and like progressively more and more insane um to the point where now like we're we're about to hit like a peak i feel and i don't even know if it's a peak because we could keep going it feels like we're going to keep going up i think so i think things have to get worse before they even can get better at this stage like something's got to give and i feel like the the the, the poles like the magnetic poles of the political sphere so to speak will continue to pendulum swing further to the extremes on either side mm -hmm. but then I, I imagine either there has to be then some kind of civil war or revolution or something has to break at that point like it will get so ridiculous that it's like hold the fuck on what the fuck are we even doing anymore who the knows are but to have that kind of um collective wake up I don't know if it's even possible at this point because the, the the political sphere doesn't it doesn't matter what reality is anymore. There's a new hyper reality. What what happens online is the new hyper reality. So now what happens on X and what happens on YouTube and this that and the other, even if it's not representative of um, reality, like say most Americans believe that there's like. 20 30 40 percent african americans in um america and that's just not true like they even th they think that there's like i don't know like five ten percent trans people and there's like like one percent uh, there's no actual basis in reality for any of these people but what is 
reality is this new hyper reality which we have online and i think this is what's the problem is that the online world is becoming more real than the actual reality that we live in and as far as people are concerned with the echo chambers they exist in and the, the media content that they consume i think that's the right word for it hyper reality it's a reality on steroids you know it's like all the worst and most controversial aspects of reality pumped and amplified and you know gamified basically um by content creators right you've got like platforms that reward people for creating content that creates hyper reality you know and yeah. people live in hyper reality because they're constantly consuming all of that content they're hardly uh you know living in the real world for most of their life they're mostly living online so hyper reality is reality for a lot of people and it's uh it's definitely polarizing people like nothing we've ever seen um, well that's the that's that's the matrix like even if you guys don't believe in we're living in a simulation or what have you the simulation you're living in is the online hyper reality that's the matrix that's mm. the matrix oh yeah we gotta unplug sometimes but I'm I'm so plugged in right now. It's kind of crazy. Although I'm <laughs> I'm really only plugged into the the StarCraft zeitgeist. You know what I mean? I'm I'm I I kind of dip my fingers, my toes in to some no. of these other areas now and then. Like, oh, what's going on over here? You know, what's going on with the Canadian election or whatever? And I like kind of poke my finger and go, Ooh, Jesus! Like, what the hell? True, oh, but I'm not ready not, for that. <laughs> but you're also not like quite like NPC level of consciousness like some people out there seem to be operating on. Mm. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not allowing myself to get completely sucked into these different spheres because I'm, I'm so focused on my own. Yeah, um, you're operating inside the matrix, but you're aware of the code around you a little bit. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm, um insulating myself away from some of the madness anyway <laughs> yeah yeah you're picking and choosing what the the matrix can do to influence you so to speak yeah true true it's so hard to avoid it though because the matrix is in our lives from birth in terms of like what you're programmed into believing and adhering to as as a child and then the media you consume, the the brands you're exposed to, what the corporations and government want you to be exposed to. Well, how long? Uh, in, kind of how long until that's all digitized? You know what I mean? Like the whole like government programming is just completely digitized, to where you don't like think think about this. Like, have you seen the new um, Chat GPT four O, the AI uh, that just shocks you? Yeah, um, a little bit. You could just like you turn it on kind of like Siri or whatever and you talk to it, but it it right. sounds like you're really talking to a person. And Yeah, like they're actually like it's, it's, it seems reminiscent of that film Her. Have you seen yeah, Her? Yeah, that's what I was hearing it com uh compared to. But, but do you know what really creeps me out? Uh, the, when I first saw that content, even though they weren't suggesting it, I know for a fact that a lot of the basement dwelling nerds are looking at that content and are instantly thinking like, "Oh, that's my that's my future girlfriend." Right. And 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 think about it like in a way they're they're marketing it to be that they're marketing it to be a replacement for the the lack of human connection that there is in the world right now. Right. Well. They're fulfilling a need, right? It's what business does. They see yeah. some, they see a need, and they fulfill it. Um, well, sometimes you can, can you can create the need, though, is the right. thing, right? Like yeah. you can also engineer that need or mm -hmm. make them believe they have that need, right? And if if society is all one big like engine, then or one big you know program, then part of the program is creating the need. Part of the program's fulfilling the need, but the the chat gpt itself i don't think is creating the need it's just it's just another part of the the larger entity which is this part is is like fulfilling that need and maybe it's going to even create 
more loneliness, right? Because you're going to be talking to chat yeah. GPT all the time. You're not going to have time to chat with people in real life. And who wants to chat with real people anyway? They're annoying. Just talk with chat GPT and tell her to shut up. AI. Whenever and the AI language. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like you can tell her to shut up whenever you want. So she's obedient to you. So that's mm. appealing. And then also, um, it's, it's a very sophisticated large language model. So it'll also maybe even get to know you a little bit. So you might start to feel like, oh, this chat GPT thing actually kind of vibes with me better than most people. Like, right. why would I even need to talk to people anymore? Yeah. And it knows everything. Like, I can just ask yeah. it any question. It knows. Yeah. It's... It doesn't get bored talking to me. Yeah. It's it's cool, man. And just to finish what I was thinking earlier is like how long until these like la large language models are like all of our kids' teachers. You know what I mean? Where you yeah. don't go to school anymore. You just listen to a version of chat GPT, which is made by your government, which will explain everything to you and like, slowly go through each and every point and under you know help you to understand and then the yeah. the pro the programming like the social conditioning can be like um you know uh what's it called like customized or like uh it, it like adapts to the the person each person individually each child individually that's you know? the scary thing is that AI is already way sophisticated enough to like have a lot of data points on who you are as a person. Like even like very rudimentary bots on Facebook can like have like a dossier on users and just know like this is your political beliefs. This is what kind of thing would engage you. This is the kind of ad you would click on. Right. They already got that, which is like already been and done. Like they've already and imagine that, but on a more sophisticated level with something of like Chat GPT's sophistication. Yeah, it would be mm -hmm. pretty scary. I've been using it for um, practicing Japanese. <laughs> I think it's a really good idea to to have for Japanese practice. Like, I don't want to go out and just try to ch talk to a random Japanese person. I I want like five minutes of chat, just practice, <laughs> <laughs> or like uh, you know online tutor or whatever. Like, I'm gonna pay somebody to to tutor me online. Why don't I just talk to oh, Chat GPT? It's going to be more appealing because, like, there's no way that a human can c compete with that level of consistency in the sense mm -hmm. of, say, a, a teacher, an AI that's a teacher, like, will be enthusiastic. Like, hey, kids, today we're going to learn this, and, mm. and they're not going to, they're not going to like hate their lives because they're not getting paid enough and they're underappreciated, and the kids are a bunch of idiots and they don't listen and blah blah blah. So, like, you haven't got any of this human element playing into the role, where it's just, like, not wanting to deal with actually, like, maybe they start off teaching with good intentions and wanting to help kids, and the system kind of, like, eats away at their soul or whatever, right? Mm. The AI doesn't care about that. AI is just ready to fucking go. Hey, guys, today we're gonna learn every mm -hmm. single fucking time. Yeah. Or, hey, Billy, today you're gonna learn, and then <laughs> each individual person has their own brand, or they're, they're totally own teacher yeah. you know what i mean that customizes everything to them and like figures out exactly what motivates them and yeah you know. <laughs> and influences them to do some crazy shit like hey billy you just need to relax and kill the elimination president <laughs> 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 yeah gets in their head and converts them to communism or something i don't know oh yeah, god Ch china gets in there and starts influencing the the u.s uh you know public school ai <laughs> starts hacking into it <laughs> yeah. that's that's kind of what I mean, that's kind of what's happened in the u.s for uh for the the just the teachers have been kind of like hacked a little bit a little bit, hacked yeah. a little bit yeah it's like a mental hack or like a uh, I'm, academic hack well what's weird it's like it's almost like a gauntlet. It's like if you want the piece of paper that lets you get access to like over fifty percent of jobs on the market, well, you better suffer through all this ideology and all this other mm. stuff if you want. It's like a, it's like a gatekeeping thing. It's like if you want to be able to have more opportunity, you you can only do that if you let us program you. Mm -hmm. And that's just a really weird to think about, right? It's a really weird way of like gatekeeping education. It's like that way, all the educated people will believe what we want them to believe, hmm. and all the poor and all the poor working class people 
who who don't have as much opportunity or as much money or whatever, well, well, they're fucked. They'll look. And that's how we they'll look, look to the educated people to figure out what to believe. Yeah. You know? Hmm. I don't know. I I don't even know if I would go to university if I could if I started life over again. Although it did help me get into all these different countries for travel and stuff for for teaching English, you need a degree. But maybe yeah. I would have taken something way less, um, yeah, well, I've, way easier. I've spoken, I have spoken to quite a few people in my extended family and and otherwise that are around like the sort of eighteen, nineteen age, and they've they've like gone to university and they've like dropped out right away, saying that it's shit and mm-hmm. that they don't want to get into a bunch of debt yeah. for that. Yeah, like 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 at the end of the day, do you want to get into however much it is, fifty to a hundred k or whatever, in debt for a piece of paper that only gives you access to half of the job market anyway? Like maybe you could get access to what you want to do even without that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I can't, I couldn't have gotten into all these different countries with without the university degree, but yeah, I I feel like maybe I could have done something. Um, totally different. Like I could have gone with uh, you know, video editing or something like that, or I could have taken some sort right. of online course, or I don't know. I could have gotten things going a lot faster, but it is what it is. You yeah, know, you that's the issue, right? It's do. a big, it's a big time investment, and there's no guarantee that you'll even be able to utilize that degree in the way that you want to in the yeah. end, anyway. Yeah, but. When I was uh, growing up, that's what everybody said. That's what you're supposed to do. So that's kind of what I did. That's that's what worked for previous generations, though. Yeah. Like, this is the problem, is that they're using an old recipe book for the modern day, and that that just spells disaster. Like, it... Like I know it's a bit of a meme, but it is it is true that it's like the the boomers are basically saying like, "Well, just get a job and buy a house." What are you talking about? And it's like, <laughs> mate, 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 I've I've got a job and I can barely pay rent. What are you talking about? Mm-hmm. I don't know how the hell that happened. It makes no sense at all. That's like some. Um, well, that's, you can look at you look up fractional robbery. reserve. Bank, yeah. Look up fractional reserve banking. That's what happened. Yeah. Well, that's. It's also just the the continued deficits over you know hundred past hundred years. People just spending way mo- more money than they had, or government spending way more money than they had, and yeah. now the interest payments are you know some massive percent of all the tax money that even goes to the government. Well, that's because that's there's insane. a big well, there's, there's a big game that's going on in the world that we're not privy to and that's Uh like people like blackrock basically buying up the fucking planet you know Mm. like there's there's these crazy companies that own everything and you might think well blackrock doesn't own everything because that guy owns something but a lot of of, of times it's all umbrella cock it's it's umbrella companies Mm. it's all it all links back to the same thing like go look up blackrock and then look up who owns everything, right? Mm-hmm. You'll see BlackRock at the top, and there'll be a few others underneath BlackRock. But then realize that the ones that are underneath BlackRock are also BlackRock. Right. Yeah, I I don't know about those companies. Like I've I've heard I've seen some videos about it. I've heard some things about it. But the thing that's really a mind blower is like the amount of debt that countries owe right now is is just insane. It's so outlandish. It's so ridiculous. Um, how can, uh, you know, anything be affordable when they have they've they've been printing money mm-hmm. so much they've inflated the currency so much? It's like, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Can, the entire economy can, doesn't make any sense. I want to give a, a quick synopsis on who BlackRock are. This is from Wikipedia, so it's not like me just bullshitting so like blackrock incorporated is an american multinational investment company is the world's largest asset manager with 10 trillion dollars in assets under management as of december 31st 2023 headquartered in new york city blackrock has 78 offices in 38 countries and clients in 100 countries go look up blackrock guys oh let me see you know that Japan has the the largest um, debt to GDP ratio in the entire world. 
they have more really? debt than anybody else yeah like oh. obviously us has the most like they have way more debt but compared to the gdp to the, yeah, 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 yeah that's pretty wild it's insane um, but I've never looked this up. Actually, I'm just going to look this up now. Um, countries with the lowest debt. Brunei has 3.2%. Um, that's, that's pretty small. Actually, it doesn't say the number. It says percentage. Um, yeah, let me see. Yeah, they're all, they're all doing percentages. I guess that's the more important number. Is like how much debt do you have as a percent of your GDP? Um, let me see. Oh wow. Okay, so I was wrong. Japan is number two actually on the list. Venezuela is number one. <laughs> <laughs> Not too surprising, I guess. Yeah, three hundred fifty percent. Holy shit. Well, yeah, that country kind of blew up in the inflation sense. But the lowest, Brun Brunei, Afghanistan, Kuwait, Congo, Eswatini, Palestine, Russia, Botswana. Wow, Russia's on, on the top eight of lowest debt to G GDP. That's kind of wild. I really hmm. didn't expect that. Yeah. Hmm, I wonder why they have so low low debt. It's kind well, of because they're not capitalists. <laughs> they they kind of are though, right? Aren't they capitalists now? Uh, they're not communists anymore. Well, they're like hybrid. It's the same with China. Like they have some capitalist elements, but they're still not capitalists. China's fascist. They're they're not they're not really communists or capitalist yeah but they 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 cherry pick like most most countries do these days they like cherry pick a few things from other systems yeah i challenge i challenge anyone the populace. Hmm? Challenge, challenge anyone to tell me like what socialist programs they have in china like there's nothing socialist about china oh, you're not, not, necessarily, not necessarily socialist but um like if you say like the capitalism side of things like look at like in russia for example like yeah. it used to be like they wouldn't have access it, 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 the reason why you see the the slavs with their like adidas track suits it used to be like a um a sign that you had connections because you couldn't go and buy a track suit like, mm. like you had to know someone that like say worked at the olympics or something to get access to it or something it was right. like a way of showing that you were a well-connected gangster you know mm -hmm. what i mean nowadays there's obviously like nothing anyone can get a track suit mm -hmm. uh, but like, uh, but that's the point is like now we have way more like capitalist elements within these countries but once upon a time it wasn't like that yeah yeah true true it's funny to think about um that uh america and the rest of the west was so worried about russia as a communist country like oh man they're gonna take over the whole world you know they're gonna make everyone communist <laughs> little did they know that people were fucking starving to death yeah they're just their country was just complete nonsense it's wild. Wild to think that people are like calling for that in America now. The educated people. It's not wild to me. I mean, Marxism is still alive and uh, it's been breeding in America for quite some time. And Russia had the. In the Cold War era, this was actually the plan. Like, if you go back and look at um, what the fuck was his name, there was a, a KGB agent. Um, that got brought over to America and he was talking about some of like Russia's like plans for America. And one of the things he was talking about was this kind of internal destabilization. Right. And it's kind of eerie when you listen back to it, it's kind of like what they wanted to do back in the cold war era is kind yeah. of carrying out now today. It's almost like they were playing the long game and helping the country eat itself alive, which also got, there's some validity to that. If you consider like some of the troll farms and stuff, which like take advantage of like, say like the BLM movement, the black lives matter thing that happened. Like there was a lot of troll farms that like immediately started like, you know, stoking the fires of that and creating division and helping and creating fake videos and 
causing tensions uh, overseas, you know? Yeah, I feel like the when the Russian, like, the USSR threat ended, America, like, put its guard down a lot, and it just opened up a, a avenue for China to just, like, dive on those same practices, you know, and, like, go down that same path of yeah. just trying to destabilize and except with an America that wasn't, like, prepared against it or, or like, you know, f- fighting back against it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, guys, if, you, if you're curious about what, we, what I was referring to, it's a former KGB agent, uh, Yuri Bezmenov, uh, from uh, 1984. Uh, there's an interview with him, and he talks about, like, uh, he warns America about, like, socialist sub- subversion and what have you. A Soviet journalist, KGB defector. Yeah, so I think I could I've link seen this. I think I've seen this uh, YouTube video. Yeah, I linked you just now, like a little uh, six-minute video. All right. Yeah, you wanted if you wanted to, you could put it up for them to watch quick, or at least like a little soundbite from it. And we can put it in the the description of the video. They can go ahead and click that. If they want to check it out. Oh, I've got sure. a, like a. I've got it on screen right here for a second. They should be able to find that. All right. Yes. Communism. We talked about it. Capitalism. We talked about it. Um, What else did we have on the menu? Oh, we had something, something else we were going to talk about. Uh, I'm, I'm, my mind's going blank right now. I was thinking about the uh, KGB defector. He died in Canada as well. That's funny. He ended up in Canada <laughs> and then... Hmm. World is if he pretty died. wild. Pretty wild, man. Oh, yeah. I knew. I know one thing we were going to talk about. Sorry, guys. Um, There's a new game that just came out or it's coming out um, from uh, Ubisoft. It's uh, the new Assassin's Creed, and it's about Japan. Um, And people have been waiting for a Japanese uh, Assassin's Creed for a really long time. People have been hyping it up and like getting ready for it and, and asking for it for a really long time. And it was finally announced just very recently, and... um. The main character, I believe, is a Japanese woman, and then there's a side character or like a secondary main character who is uh, the very first ever historical character that they've had um, as like a playable character in any of the Assassin's Creed games, and it's uh, Yasuke, who is like a, a black guy who was a um retainer for Oda Nobunaga he's like one of the only black guys who became like a fighter in Japan he wasn't technically I think a samurai but he was something close to that and so they're putting him in as the secondary main character and people were pissed about it man they were so mad especially in Japan Mm -hmm. in Japan they went ape um the Japanese trailer for this uh for for the new game got ratioed into the ground 3.5k likes 35,000 dislikes whoa so like a yeah, 10 that's, times that's a heavy backlash so people are not not happy about this one at all well i'm not going to lie I, 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 uh... Okay, so if I'm being totally unbiased and fair, I have to first give credit that, okay, it's not the main character that this is at issue with, but it's still a playable character. In the, um, and it, I think the main issue here is that it comes across as pandering rather than anything else. Like, it doesn't seem like it's to lend to the plot of the game in any way or to, like, you know improve the artistry of the game or whatever like by having that character it seems more like just pandering to the to a certain group of people you know 
I also heard that like some of the architecture in the in the video was like more Chinese than Japanese. So it feels like they're just not really um being faithful to the the time period in general which and and the place that they're trying to make this about which is right. pretty disappointing um i don't know how much that is uh, of that is true but it uh it feels it feels like what we were talking about before which is the pandering to like race or like race baiting and then being like an idiot about it do you know what i mean like the if you you know if you vote for trump you ain't black that type of shit like you know no. trying trying to like vie for brownie points by being completely insensitive do you know what i mean i know exactly what you mean um in, in fact there's a, a film uh i saw recently i think it's called um, is it american fiction i'm gonna quickly look this up um really good film you guys should check that out and it, it does really perfectly talk about this issue in america right now where it's literally just like a bunch of white middle class people that think they even know what it means to be black and as soon as they see something fit the stereotype of what they they, they see black people as then then they're happy then it's like oh yeah yeah then they clap and they give those people a platform and drown out the voices of other black people because they only want the voices of this that what fits their narrative and, it, and it's the most racist shit ever because they're essentially saying that like, they, they they think little of black people they think that all the only all black people are like this like it's racist on like every level yeah you only have value if you like agree with me as you know or you agree with the the majority if you're black, you know what I mean? If you if you don't agree with yeah. us, then you know, you're you're not actually uh, worthy of my like uh, of the oppression olympics, you know what I mean? Like the the pressed class mm -hmm. sta status that's given I'm handing this down to you. I'm giving you attention um not because you deserve attention, but because it's like uh uh, you know, you're an oppressed class, so we need to like raise you up to like fix some sort of um, mm -hmm. imbalance in society. It, it's so silly. It's it's well, kind of gross. It's it's ironic racism, is what I'll say. Yeah. Well, what's really funny about this film is that he's the main character, um, Jeffrey Wright, starring as Monk, is a, a he's like he's like this frustrated novelist, and he's fed up with the establishment profiteering from black entertainment that relies on like tired and offensive like stereotypes and tropes, right? But so to prove his point, he uses a pen name to write a really out there, like stereotypical black kind of book of his own, right? Okay. And but what what's what's ironic is that that's what makes him famous. Like him taking the piss and like trying to show what's wrong about the industry is what is getting him all the attention. And it's like it's the the, the hypocrisy and madness of that like spirals. Hmm. Sounds interesting. Cuz he literally starts like like putting on a voice while on phone calls to like you know make himself seem more stereotypical as possible and like to like sell himself as this like pen name to like kind of make fun to, to both profit himself and also to make fun of what what's wrong with that industry hmm. and, and all the middle class white people are just like lapping up everything he, he says and does that's wild yeah, that sometimes art really does imitate reality, hey? Yeah. I think so. Hmm. That's uh that's interesting. I might have to check that out. That's a really good film. I recommend it to everyone. Hmm. Alright, well, the the Japanese people were not happy about this this uh this new game and they're really they were really pissed off reading some comments they're very upset <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness let's 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 take a look at this guys I'll, I'll bring it up on screen here there's the the new assassin's creed go ahead and bring this over a little bit you can see the like to dislike ratio is insane 
Um, it seems like not even there, there are some Japanese people in here, but there's quite a few like highly liked comments. Um, this one with 3,000. So Ubisoft is telling us that an Asian Japanese meal does not even deserve a main character role in a Japan East Asian story. And a black man character is really not, who was, who really was not important in Japan, Japan history becomes the savior of the people in Japan. This is just very disrespectful to the people of Japan. I, I kind of agree with that. I mean, imagine if there was like uh, Assassin's Creed about Africa, like somewhere in Africa, and it was like a Chinese person. You know what I mean? Who was like uh, uh -huh. the main character or the you know the secondary main character? Uh, we don't know if he's actually going to be a savior. So I think this is stepping up, stepping it up a little bit. You know, like um, yeah. hyperbole here because he doesn't really know what the character's role is going to be, but um. It is just funny that he's like, he's like a main part of this, and it just, yeah, it really does feel like pandering, like you were saying. It's hard not to see it as pandering. I mean, it's a pretty big reach to use that character anyway in the first place. So they would have to really justify it in the, the plot to to make sense of even that 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 direction. And it, it does, yeah. It, it, at the moment, it just screams like. We care about optics, profit, and pandering to a certain crowd. It doesn't seem anything but that. So I can see the outrage, and I'm sure there's some other issues that maybe the um, Japanese citizens are seeing with it as well beyond that, but I can't fully appreciate that not being Japanese. So, Yeah. I I just don't understand why it wasn't good enough for them to just make like a make up a new character. You know what I mean? Why can't this is the one time that they've ever not had like a original character. They're using like a historical figure as a main character. Hmm. From what I from what I understand, I haven't played all of the games, but this is what I've heard is I'm that enough, yeah. that there are like historical characters in the game, but they're like part of the story, not the main character. Yeah, Do you know what I mean. You're not playing as them. Yeah, yeah. You're playing as like an assassin from that era. That's exactly. kind of like an unknown entity. Yeah. And the, the point is that the assassins are not going to be part of history. Well, they're supposed to be in the shadows of history. You know that they wouldn't be remembered because they right. are supposed to be like ghosts. You know what I mean. So like the well, fact that it's a famous person doesn't really make a lot of sense for the story or the well plus there's like another meta layer of um separation because you're playing as a guy that's playing as that if that makes sense because you're you're playing as a guy that's like going back into memories to go back in time to take that role of that assassin you're not technically the assassin himself you're playing the role of a guy playing the role of the assassin per se mm. right you're like supposed to be a descendant of one of the assassins who's like using yeah. a machine to go back into exactly. their body or whatever and relive their memories which is a cool concept mm. it was and, a fun um, game the first one i played it was it was decent the yeah. very first one yeah i haven't played all of them i think I, I i've tried like i think black flag was the last one i tried i wasn't super into it but i think yeah the original was pretty good was a groundbreaking concept at the time, I remember. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so yeah, I remember mean, having a lot of fun with it. Yeah, that's that's all I wanted to mention. It's just a funny controversy and being here in Japan. Um, it's just funny to think about all the Japanese gamers getting pissed off about that, and like the backlash on Ubisoft. I'm sure is is massive. Um. The, the pandering is is not gonna work out. The, so they say like go go woke go broke something like that. Get woke go broke. Yeah, that's 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 the expression. But I mean, we'll see how what the what the sales reflect and what have you. Like yeah, I this mean, this is the problem that if the game if good. they still make enough sales, yeah, if the game's good and they still have a bit large enough sales, they probably won't care about the backlash. It depends on how much the sales are affected. Yeah.
I mean, I'm sure it will have some effect, but I personally think the games probably are going downhill anyway. How can you make so many? How can you make so <laughs> many Assassin's Creed games? It's such a long series now. Well, that that also worries me that if, if if there's an emphasis on pandering, it makes me worry that like the game itself isn't going to be that good, and they like want to try and make up for that. You know what I mean? They're using inclusiveness to like add to their brand. I right. Hate, I hate how companies are like that. Have you noticed? Have you heard about this? Everything's that, optics. Everything's optics. Yeah. That Google is um firing a bunch of people now for. Uh, you know, being too disruptive with their, uh, you know, support for different causes. Oh, really? Yeah, like I they're, didn't actually hear that. they're going out and protesting and like they're doing like sit ins and stuff like that, Google employees, and then getting fired by the company. The company's like kind of um, pivoting now. And the leadership well, has decided a... like we're not going to tolerate people bringing their politics into work which like a year ago, two years ago, yeah. was all the rage. Do you know what I mean? That reminds me of that. I can't remember exactly what it was recently where like these people that work for like YouTube or something were like activists that weren't actually actively working. They were still employees, but they weren't actually working. They were, act, you know, they were like whistleblowing and like trying to cause up a fuss and like they just got fired eventually randomly, mm -hmm. like even like mid talk. Yeah, I think companies are starting to realize that yeah, like sometimes the trouble is just not worth it, and they 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 will probably go the other way. That's the pendulum swinging back and forth. Like like I said, something has to get worse before it gets better. You know, it has to get so crazy that people actually start doing something about it. Well, here's what I think is that the companies never really cared about any of these issues. It no. just wasn't a problem for them. So it's like, uh, for any company, you know what I mean. Um, the only reason that they're flying you know, uh, rainbow colored flags or whatever is because that's the mood of the current time. You know what yeah. I mean? And like Literally. they do a value calculation, like what is the, the net negative of doing this and what's the positive and the net, the negative is less than the positive. So they just do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And as soon as the, the pressure or like the, the backlash or, or the like overall negative of doing that thing, supporting whatever thing like they're not morally um righteous or they're not doing it from any sort of moral point of view they're just, oh, just yeah, a they're value sure. proposition it's just Literally. like if i can if if as a company i can just say that i support whatever cause lgbtq or whatever the hell it is um and it doesn't cost me anything <laughs> then i'm of course i'm gonna do it i get i get something for nothing so yeah that there it's just funny to me people thinking that some certain companies are on their side or that they're like morally good um or better than other companies it's like dude none of them give a shit about you at all none of them none yeah. of them care they're not they're not yeah, interested I mean, it's like a, a virus like it can spread fast but it can also die fast you know yeah it seems like the only co company that was really I don't know if I can even say that. I I guess. Hmm. The company that seemed to be like very morally righteously driven was Twitter when it was being like really, really, um, you know, ban heavy against certain topics. Well, they, you know, they, they were literally like, had like an army of employees yeah. like dedicated to the that agenda. Yeah. Yeah, to like a certain one side of of a political argument, you know? And then uh, kind of Google was doing the same sort of thing. You know, they're like banning certain subjects and like um being way more harsh on certain topics than others uh for YouTube and for, you know, the the like, monetization, taking away monetization from people that they're not uh aligned with, you know, politically, but I guess that's just the the employees at the company. Like the employee culture is it a certain way, and so you know they're tasked by Google to get rid of you know certain elements um and 
they're the the people at it, that are in those roles are just more you know morally aligned with one side than the other so they just like have that bias you know what i mean and they like lean that direction and so no. it feels like the company might be like orchestrating it but i think it's actually just the employees at the company and the comp the employees have like created that culture of like thinking that one side is better or you know these th these sort of ideas are acceptable and these are not well it's easy to think that you're right when you silence everyone that says that you're wrong yeah true <laughs> true yep absolutely Ugh. Well, wow. that's the problem with most people that they haven't had any of their ideas challenged. I, I don't mean necessarily ridiculed. I just mean literally challenged. Mm -hmm. And like, and, and that's a good thing. It's a healthy thing because it might help you understand even more why you feel the way you feel about certain things. It might help you uh, even double down on the your stances because you realize, hang on a minute, not only do I feel that way, but I feel that way even stronger than I thought. And then you can even justify it better that way once you like really figure it out. Right. Yeah. True, true. Got to challenge your ideas. Got to have friends who are willing to challenge your ideas as well. So important. I don't know if I agree with that saying, actually. I want to challenge you on that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're a good friend, Shun. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. All right. Well, let's let's end there. It's getting a little late. Um, yeah, sure. I think I've said everything I want to say. Uh, too bad that we had that kind of late start with the audio issues yeah. uh we'll we'll clean that up for the future you got to do more tests that i remember to, to test it out yeah that's not <laughs> bad we, we both could have remembered to do the audio test properly first so we'll try and get on top of that next time yeah and uh you'll be on for the next kcm for sure oh yeah absolutely it's coming I'm up. up for it on the 24th we're gonna hit that uh, semi-finals tvz it's gonna be fun even if i do have food poisoning i'll cast it from the toilet the audio quality <laughs> might be a little bit bad i'll have to set up push the talk on my phone but we'll get it sorted <laughs> out guys don't worry all right <laughs> okay guys we'll see you next week peace out peace